as was already mentioned, we're starting a, a new series of, of lessons this, this morning. Mending Offenses is the name of this set of lessons. Uh, it is a reprint. We've been through it before. I really enjoyed it the first time around. Looking forward to uh, hearing it again. This first lesson, Whence Come Offenses. Okay. Is that mending offenses? No. Or mending offenses? It's mending offenses. Okay. It's, it's mending two offenses. words. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's very punny, for sure. In the medical arena, the condition of high blood pressure is often called the silent killer. Why? High blood pressure, also called hypertension, does not exhibit, does not always exhibit, obvious outward manifestations by which it can be recognized as would a broken leg, for example. While it has no such outward manifestations, high blood pressure can be deadly since it can contribute to the de development of many other life-threatening afflictions, including heart attacks, strokes, kidney disease, and eye conditions leading to blindness. In the spiritual realm, we find another silent killer that is just as deadly to our spiritual health as high blood pressure can be to our physical health. Sorry. Consider for a moment the people you may know who in the past were faithful members of the body of Christ, the Church of God. They walked with us and had sweet fellowship. Then for some reason, they turned away and no longer walked with us. Why did they leave? What could have been done to have prevented their falling away? In particular, how do we overcome this silent killer of the soul? In this quarter's lessons, we'll seek to better understand the silent killer how it gains its foothold, how to recognize it, how to deal with it when it appears, and better still, how to avoid it in the first place. What is this silent killer? Being offended ourselves or causing offenses to others. To help us understand the silent spiritual killer, consider its formal definition, which can exhibit increasing degrees of intensity and consequence. One, irritate, annoy, anger, cause resentful displeasure in. Affect disagreeably as the sense, taste, etc. Three, violate or transgress a criminal, religious, or moral law. Four, hurt or cause pain to. Five, in biblical use, cause to fall into sinful ways. A given offense may progress through all these phases. As with high blood pressure, an offense may not immediately exhibit outward manifestations. Instead, offended people often will hold their hurt and resentment to themselves. And what began as mild irritation or annoyance can lead eventually, if not addressed, to bitterness, anger, resentment, then on to disagreements, arguments, to hurt and pain, and eventually spiritual death. Additionally, it affects both the offended and the offenders. The adverb eventually used here is important. While the consequences of one offense may be immediately manifested and hopefully addressed, when it first occurs, another offense may fester over many years before its full impact and harm is manifested. During that time, its impact ultimately may touch the lives of many others beyond those directly involved in the original offense. Golden truth, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. James 3 and 2. Have any thoughts, comments, questions? This introductory part of this lesson. Um, with this scripture I think about it quite a bit if any man offend not in word the same as a perfect man able to bridle the whole body um, the church is going on to perfection so I'm guessing that if, when we are perfected that's when 
those people are not will not offend by a word or absolutely because it seems like constantly at least for me and I'm guessing everybody else because everybody that I come in contact with has has a hard time bridling their bridling their tongue mm -hmm. and um, offend people right and um, that also comes in with love that we've talked about quite absolutely a bit. and um, I think that's where we as the church of God are missing absolutely that's, Certainly. that's where I guess our perfect that's where we need to be perfected you know a lot of people have you know the 29 teachings down they live their lives as perfectly in quotes as they possibly can checking the boxes right and checking boxes but it says that someone who can bridle the tongue is mm -hmm. a perfect man right so um, to me we've not reach perfection yet and most people that maybe think that they have and just sitting and waiting on everybody else if you really look um, you can tell well you shall know them by their fruits what right. Jesus said and, and so I believe we're going to see when we see that perfection it's going to be a great a marvelous thing because I mean I can see see you I gotta use you as an example. I almost use Brother Nick, but I can see you. See you as living your life the best possible way, but you might not always bridle your tongue. Mm -hmm. So that's something that will that you work on. That's something that I work on, and other people. And it just makes me think. You know, we've we've got to get that tongue bridled. Absolutely. Our body. I mean, it even says the whole body. Mm -hmm. So if you've got the whole body bridled, right, you're not going to go cheat on your spouse you're not going to go drink you're not going to smoke you're not going to do drugs because you're keeping your body bright right. so to speak reserve not do it. if you don't speed you know and you're following the laws of the land you're keeping your <laughs> self bridled from right. putting your foot down on the gas and going faster than you should and you're not killing people you're not doing that but it seems like our biggest problem is this unrolling member here so the wonderful thing you were talking about the perfection of the church the wonderful thing about the perfection of the church uh, there are many who teach uh, that christians will be perfected as they go up in the rapture but i believe that the bible makes it clear that that's a fallacy that's that's not so we will be perfected prior to the rapture and and once again as you said the church will be perfected. None of us question that. But the wonderful thing about that is we will not be perfected simultaneously. You and I and everybody else in this, this room, those who are watching on the internet, and those who are outside of this building, in, anywhere else, it's not necessarily so that each and every one will be perfected simultaneously at the same moment, but rather each of us, as we have that desire to draw closer to the Lord will become perfected and the, once again another wonderful thing about perfection is when we are individually perfect then that will influence others positively and it will progress as it should uh, just like yawns are contagious the will of God is contagious if you hang around people who are doing the will of God then you are likely to do the same. If you're hanging around people who are gossiping and, and backbiting and uh, causing offenses, then chances are good those are the things that you're going to be doing. That's like when you're, we're working on ourselves. Mm -hmm. If we each work on ourselves, right. and we're like, well, I'm going to keep myself bridled from this, that, and the other, then I want to work on my unruly member, I'm mm -hmm. going to work on those things that I'm falling short because I know there's things that I'm falling short on. Right. And I need to make sure that that's, you know, taken care of so I can be there so that I can be, like you right. said, an example. Right. That'll be an encouragement when you start seeing perfection on people. It's, uh, and it's not like somebody saying, I'm perfected, look at me. Right. But you can tell in your spirit that person has reached a mark that not many people have. And once uh, again... That's absolutely. Reached or obtained, 
Yeah, and that would be an encouragement. There are so many people around that say you have to sin every day. Mm. Well, you don't. Right. You don't have to sin every day, and most of us probably we don't. But when we are, um, if we're able to broaden our, ourselves in other things, like I said, smoking, drinking, doing drugs, um, going out and you know, going out on your spouse, going to a bar and doing things, you know, speeding. I don't know. I'm trying to think of everything that I can think of it, that we've got it taken care of under, you know, checking. The, I hate to say checking the boxes, but following that. But there's nothing in there that says bridle your tongue in the 29 teachings. That's exactly right. But if we are able and God is able to help us through bridling those other things, then we should be able to also, with his help, take care of that too. That's, that's exactly right. And all of this comes together. Uh, none of us have the ability to do that on our own. And you know, any of us who have been alive for any ex period of time know that there's very little that we can do on our own, but we rely on the Spirit. And that bridling that we're talking about is, is putting ourselves under, the, under subjection of the Spirit of God. As uh, <laughs> just the thought came to me immediately, just, just now as we're discussing this, uh, a horse. Horses often have to be broken before they can be ridden. Uh, and in, part of that is submitting themselves to the bridle, to the reins, to understanding what those directions, those instructions mean from the rider. Uh, the horse is not required to do that. And there are some horses who will not submit to it. And that's why we have rodeos, because those horses will not submit themselves to being ridden. And so it's up to us as individuals to submit ourselves to the Spirit so that He can use us uh, as He would Anything else? Uh, hay algo interesante que me llama la atención cuando, cuando vemos lo que dice el apóstol San, Santiago. There's something that, that is interesting that I've noticed um, about what the apostle James says. Uh, bueno, punto número uno porque uh, ellos batallaron con todo esto. Because first of all, they, they struggled with that. Si vemos la vida de cada uno de los apóstoles. And if we look at the lives of all of the apostles. Ellos, este, uh, cuando ellos fueron, tuvieron el llamado, When they were called, ellos no, no tenían esa perfección. They didn't have that perfection. O sea, de primera a primera. At first. Eh, el Señor Jesucristo tuvo que enseñarles a ellos. The Lord had to teach them. En varias ocasiones vemos que ellos actuaron. We see on several occasions that they, how they acted. Y actuaban de una manera. Para <laughs> ellos que actuaban. Bien, and for them, that, to them, they were acting just fine. But the Lord showed them that they weren't. Entonces, uh, vemos como, con que ellos so we can see what their struggles were. Pero ellos alcanzaron la perfección. But they reached perfection. Porque, uh, el maestro, because the master, él tuvo la paciencia. he had patience with them. Right. Y el tiempo, and he spent time with them para enseñar. to teach them. De igual manera para con nosotros hoy en día. And also with us today, Vamos a alcanzar la perfección. We're going to reach perfection si permitimos if we allow que Dios that we allow God de nos perfeccione. If we allow God to perfect us. Pero right. tenemos que tener este, uh, esa relación continua. But we have to have that continuous relationship with God. Ahora, en Mateo capítulo 12, in uh, Matthew chapter 12, verso 37, verse 37, hay algo interesante que el Señor Jesucristo dijo. Lord says something very interesting there. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Aquí no se trata que mi hermano diga, hable como actúe como actúe. And it's, it, it's not a matter of Brother Rick acting like he, he acts. El punto es the point is que la escritura me señala that the uh, scripture points out to me me and it exhorts me que tenga, que preste atención. that I have to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Ahora, si vamos un poquito más atrás, and looking a little bit before that, lo que el Señor dijo este, en el verso 36, in verse 
verso 36 dice, Mas yo os digo que toda palabra ociosa que hablar en los hombres, de ella darán cuenta en el día del juicio. In verse 36 it says, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Dijo el Señor Jesucristo de toda palabra ociosa. He said every idle word. Cuando yo veo estas escrituras When I read those scriptures, y me encuentro en medio de tal vez de mis compañeros and I'm, uh, with my coworkers, escuchando todos los días cosas ociosas listening all day to sí. idle things es, <coughs> trae tristeza. It brings a sadness. Y le doy gracias a Dios ¿verdad? por la por la regeneración But I think, thank God for regeneration. que ha hecho en mi vida that he's done in my life. And that causes me to pray for, pray for them. Pero, bueno, este, uh, es, es, es muy, me llama mucho la atención esta parte donde dijo el Señor, este, en el verso 37. But I see what uh, Jesus says there in verse 37. Porque por tus palabras serás justificado, y por tus palabras serás condenado. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Y aquí es donde tenemos que tener mucho cuidado, porque el punto es, ¿Cómo estamos? ¿Cómo estoy delante de Dios? The point is, how am I before God? Porque tal vez puedo ser movido maybe I can be, uh, moved a mirar el, el error de, de mi prójimo. To look at my, my, my neighbor's error. Uh -huh. Entonces, uh, tengo que tener mucho ese cuidado. And I have to be careful. Hay, hay mucho que podemos aprender And there's no, a lot that we can learn. de lo que el apóstol uh, Santiago no sabe. Uh -huh. From what James, Apostle James says. <laughs> yeah. Definitivamente necesitamos el de Dios. Basically, we just need the Spirit of God. Usted mencionó algo muy interesante. And you said something very interesting. Mencionó un animal. And you were talking about an animal. Uh -huh. Cuando ese animal es, es manso. When that animal is meek. Es amadestrado. Es quebrado su, su, su cuello. When he's when broken. Cuando el, 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 el amo le pone lo que es el freno. When the master puts on the bridle. Puede, puede, puede guiar todo el cuerpo. He can guide, he can guide the entire body. Right. Todo el cuerpo. Right. The whole body. Bien dócil. And he's very um, docile. Ya no, ya no, repre, ya no, ya no, no representa este, uh, un temor que va a hacer algo. It does, there's no fear that, that the animal might do something. Ofensivo. Offensive. Right. <laughs> Pero algo But he also says que hay that there also you also said there are horses so, so that are, that are, that can't be do dominated. Right. God help us. <clears throat> yes, indeed. I I want to be that horse yes. who is willing to accept the bridle of Christ, the bridle of the Spirit so that he can lead me in the direction that I need to go. Yeah. And the one thing about offenses, I, I think the lesson is going to go into it later, but I just feel compelled to go ahead and say something now. I can't fix you. I, I can't fix what you say. I can't fix what you hear when I say it. If you hear it in a way that I don't mean it, me, it's, it's my responsibility to allow Christ to bridle my tongue. <clears throat> and I can't do anything beyond that. And talking about horses, I know James talked about horses, but uh, thinking of that, I can't put, as a horse, I can't put the bridle on myself. I can submit myself to the, to the master, to the rider, and him putting it on, but I can't put it on myself. And if I can't put my own bridle on my own face, then I have no hope of putting the bridle on you. I can't do it. Nothing I say or do is going to cause you to submit yourself to the bridle of the Spirit. I, I, more than cause offense. I mean, you got hooves. I mean, you don't even have fingers. I go try to try to put a bridle on some other horse, and all I have is hooves. I'm going to whack him in the face. I, I'm going to make somebody mad. And so it is in our lives when we, when we think it's our responsibility to put the bridle on somebody else, we can't do it. For a horse, the only thing we can do is submit to the bridle of the spirit. We can't put the bridle on any anyone else. We can't cause anybody else 
We can't make anybody else come under subjection of the Spirit. Part one, how serious are offenses? Very serious. In our Golden Truth, James describes both the importance and the difficulty we face when attempting to address the spirit of offense, to find a way to prevent of offenses and to remedy offenses when they occur. The entire third chapter of James is dedicated to our difficulty in controlling our tongues and the importance of why we must do so. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. Luke 6, 45. Now this is Jesus speaking here. And if you want to check your own self, this is a wonderful verse of Scripture. If we'll allow it. We, we often want to take this passage of Scripture and put it on others. To place it, place it on someone else. Well, this person said this or did this and they're not doing the right thing. The best thing for us to do with this passage of Scripture is remember about that bridle that we can't put on ourselves. We only have to submit ourselves to it. This, this passage of Scripture, this verse, Jesus speaking, He's speaking to individuals. He's speaking to me. If I look at the words that I speak, and they're not benefiting those around me, then what's in my heart? It's, it's time for me to submit my heart to the bridle of the Spirit so that those good words can come out of me. And if I'm saying that which is good, if I'm speaking those things that are beneficial, that are um, edifying to those around me, at all times then I know that I am in subjection to the Spirit and He is in control of my life. As, as this Wendy pointed out, we know the power of offenses and we, we know, we should know when we're falling short. And if we're falling short, it's our responsibility to recognize it and do whatever is necessary to come under that subjection of the Spirit. Christ summarized our situation and the burden we bear in our efforts to control our tongues. He equated controlling our tongues with controlling our hearts. Clearly, getting control over what comes forth from our speech is directly dependent upon gaining control of what is in our hearts. I believe it was Jeremiah who said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That being the case, it's imperative, it's critical that we submit ourselves to that bridal of Christ, that bridal of the Spirit, so that we can know that our hearts will not lead us astray. Our hearts will not lead us in the wrong direction. Christ died and shed His blood for our salvation. He also lived the perfect example for us to follow. This point is often stressed by the frequently repeated adage in years past, WWJD, or what would Jesus do? To help us with our tongues, perhaps we could restate this adage as WWJS. What would Jesus say? Every day we are judged by those around us based on what's what proceeds from our speech, including those things we don't say. Our actions or our inactions also can speak loudly. Learning to avoid offenses as far as possible and to quickly address any when they occur is critical to the Christians, the Christians living an unblameable life, one that is perfect before God. Now just as I was reading this studying, I thought, this takes us right back to last quarter's lessons, where, where we ba which were based on Romans, where we read Romans 12 and 18. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. As much as lieth in you. 
We can't do anything about others. But we can do something about ourselves and how we respond. As it's not always necessarily so that we are the ones who instigate the offense. Sometimes someone says something and we react. Uh, Wendy here recently has been talking about the difference between reaction, being reactive and proactive. We need to recognize that in our lives and once again submit ourselves to the Spirit so He can take control. Because we, when He's in control, we won't react inappropriately. We'll act in a way that benefits. If someone says something that's, that's hurtful to us, uh, here recently I, I had to do it and it was hard because someone, someone said something to me that hurt me. And I just wanted to be mad at him. <laughs> but I took it to them and I told them. And I apologized for my anger, and, but I apologized for being upset. But I wanted them to know that the things that they said hurt me and, and it was offensive to me. And I didn't want that animosity between us. And the problem was resolved. It was over. As much as lieth in you. I, if I'd gone to that person and they'd gotten upset with me, there's nothing I can do about it. As much as lieth in you. Live peaceably with all men. Um, yes? There is a scripture that came to my mind that I think has left. <laughs> What? It's, um, uh, and I'm really, I'm really trying to remember it because it goes right along with what we're talking about right now. Oh, Psalms. Psalm, yeah. Psalm 19, I believe it is. At the very end of that chapter, something that I am never able to just pass over being as familiar as this passage is, where it says, let the words of my mouth and, and, and the, the meditations of my heart. Of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Right. Oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And it's like, to me, that makes the, I mean, of course, not that we could ever not be accountable for God, <laughs> but it really does turn up the heat, so mm -hmm. to speak, with the, or turn up the accountability, I should right. say. Right. Like, it's not, it's, it's, I'm not limited to just what you hear right. as another human coming Absolutely. out of my mouth. That's not where my accountability stops. Right. And it, be, and it mentions both of those things, the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart. So if it never came out of my mouth, but it stayed inside, mm -hmm. in the heart, I'm saying I want that to be acceptable to God too. Right. So if you never heard me say what was in my heart, mm -hmm. God is still going to see it. And I, and I want him to be pleased with that too. Still accountable. And so I'm still accountable. That's so uh, just very... There's, there are so many who look at the Old Testament and think, well, the Old Testament was about doing, and the New Testament is about thinking, uh, motivation. But I think Jesus set everybody straight with the, with the uh, Sermon on the Mount when He said, You have heard, or you have read, but I say unto you. And what He was reminding the Jews at that time was, it's not simply about your actions. It's about those thoughts that motivate the actions. Because before we do or say anything, that thought is in our head. Of course, the Bible says that thought is in our heart. So we are accountable not only for, as Sister Shanna said, our words and our deeds, but the motivation behind them. Even if we never say anything, even if we never act on those thoughts that we have, it's that, that rebellion begins within us before we ever actively behave contrary to the will of God. The thoughts, the, the, the motivations lie within us. And I love that. That's a wonderful, wonderful, important verse of Scripture concerning offenses. Very few would actually direct it towards offenses, but I think that 
that very aptly fits this lesson. Part two, how pervasive are offenses? Another aspect of offenses that makes them silent, this silent killer so dreadful is the extent to how much spiritual damage they can cause. The consequences of this silent spiritual killer are far more pervasive than one might at first realize. Consider for a moment the former members you know who at one time walked with us and shared our fellowship, but now have left the safety of God's fold. What happened to cause them to turn away? For so many of these, for so many of these missed ones, their departure was not the result of their having succumbed to some great, grateful, sinful lusts, such as adultery or some other fragrant immorality. Rather, many of these departed because of an offense. They believed they had suffered and the failure of the offense to be addressed before it fest its festering ultimately led to their spiritual death. Why does Satan seem able to make such effective use of offenses to divide God's people and ultimately cause them to fall? Now remember, the, the biblical meaning of offense is to cause one to fall. The reasons are numerous and complex, as the lessons of this quarter will, quarter will seek to reveal. One reason is that offenses often can be so difficult to recognize by all parties involved. Their causes may not be reality, but rather someone, what someone has perceived or misunderstood. Now there are offenses that are open and flagrant, obvious offenses that people have committed. There are others that are spoken in innocence, yet they're received by the ones who hear them as, a, as an offense. Some parties may view the offense as being simple, unintentional misunderstanding that should be quickly forgotten with no real apology needed, while other parties may deeply, be deeply disturbed either by the actual offense or by the perceived inadequate response of the other parties to the offense. What are the sources of offenses? They can occur any time there is a misunderstanding between people or someone's behavior does not measure up to the expectations of others. There may not always be a clear demarcation of who offended whom, all parties believing the others to be at fault. There be, may be no physical basis for an offense. Nothing has been specifically said or done, but someone feels as if they've been in some way mistreated or misunderstood. Offenses are deep and powerful weapons that the enemy wants to use to destroy God's people. The sooner we are aware of the devil's devices, the sooner we can respond properly to them and allow the Spirit to affect the outcome that He would have which takes us to mending offenses, restoring those offended individuals. Part three, one thing we can quickly recognize regarding offenses is that their ability to cause damage and harm often bears no relation to the actual truth of the matter. Sometimes it does, not always. Whether the details of the perceived offense really occurred or the offended person was simply mistaken, the consequence of the offense was the same. Whether the, offense, whether the offense was malicious or accidental, again, the offense brings about the same results. What is one to do or how should one behave in light of the harm that offenses can cause? Solomon in his wisdom regarding the perniciousness of, of offenses made the following observation. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city and their contentions are like the bars of a castle. Dealing with offenses which have already occurred can be a most difficult matter that can require much effort by everyone involved for them to be resolved. As the bars of a castle serve to both keep one inside and the other outside, so also offenses can place almost insurmountable barriers between brothers and sisters in the Lord. In our frustration, we may become tempted to give up in belief that no solution is possible. 
In that case, Satan wins. How far does the Lord expect us to go? How much effort should we make to push through those bars and walls to find a solution to the offended state? The Lord has made His feelings regarding how we ought to deal with offenses quite clear for both the offender and the one who feels offended. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First, be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. When we find that we have offended a brother or a sister, we are charged to be reconciled to that offended one. Only then may we with joy approach our high priest and Lord with our supplications and full ex expectation that he will hear and accept them. We do, not want, we do not wait for that person to reach out to us. We reach out to them. Mark eleven twenty five, And when ye stand praying, forgive if he had aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. Once again, thinking about this, Jesus made it clear in, in what we call the Lord's Prayer. He said, forgive us our, our debts as we forgive our debtors. And if there was any question as to what He meant by that, at the very end He said, for if you forgive not those who offend you, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. We need to be quick to forgive just as Jesus was for us. It's so hard. Scripture. So I mean, very it's hard. hard. And, and yet, even sometimes as humans, it's still not enough to grasp mm -hmm. how vital to our relationship with God, first and foremost, that forgiveness is. But to know that God will not forgive me if I don't forgive others. That's right. I mean, it is really, really... It's a very fearful thought. Absolutely. Because I've been my whole life serving God, mm -hmm. doing everything in the ministry, and get to the end of my life and hear depart from me because I didn't forgive. Right. I mean, that brings it, that brings it home, really. Mm -hmm. Just like in Corinthians, I think it's 13, talks about we can do all these things, give our bodies to be burned. Do all the sign minutes, but if we have not shared, don't have love. It profit us nothing. So we got we got to let we're gonna to have to love one another. We ain't gonna make it. Right, right. What about the situations where someone has offended us? Christ has addressed that situation as well. Whether the parties who offended us ever admit the situation exists, let alone make effort to reach out to us, we are commanded unilaterally to offer our forgiveness. If they won't hear us, then what? It's still our duty forget, to forgive them from the depths of our hearts. Our forgiveness must be as sincere and complete as God's forgiveness to us, who has, come, who has promised in Micah 7.19 that He would cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. I might just finish this lesson. Conclusion. With this first lesson regarding offenses, we have just begun to explore the seriousness and the extent of their effects and consequences. Offenses are the chosen silent killers that Satan uses so effectively to bring harms to, harm to God's children, to drive a wedge between them, and to ultimately secure their fall from grace. By God's grace and mercy and His Word and Spirit guiding us, we should never succumb to the flagrant sins of the world with its rampant immorality and lascivious lifestyles. On the other hand, all of us, all of us can expect to experience offenses at some time and probably many times in our lives. Whether we are the offender or the offended, Either case can be a painful experience. We want to understand the nature of this silent tool of Satan and how to overcome it. You can't overcome something unless you know what it is that you're trying to overcome. We need to learn how to overcome it so that we may become even better Christians for having endured the offenses 
And just as I'm reading this, I, think, I thought of uh, Joseph and <laughs> some serious offenses there. His brothers sold him into slavery. Then uh, cast into prison. Unjustly cast into prison. If anyone had a right to hold a grudge, I, I think he did. <laughs> I think he had a right to be angry with his brothers. I, I think he had a right to be... Um, uh, upset with uh, Potiphar's wife. But he wasn't. He, he, and I, Wendy and I in our Bible studies, we've talked about this before. And I, I'm telling you right now, I guarantee Joseph was not happy with the situation. He didn't enjoy being sold into slavery. But he recognized what was going on and he made the best of the situation he had. I feel confident that he didn't appreciate being thrown into prison for something he didn't do. But he made the boat the best of the situation. So much so, <laughs> he was pretty much a trustee in the prison. They put him in charge of taking care of the other prisoners. What do we do with the trials that we face? What do we do with those when those around us come against us. Thinking about, once again about Joseph, it wasn't just his family. Because his family, you would expect them to be good to him, to take care of him. But they didn't. And those who employed him, well, you never know with a boss what, what you're going to get. And in Joseph's case, his boss's wife wasn't that great. So, so it's not just family who can offend us. It's not just family who can come against us. But it's those outside. And we need to recognize that offenses are going to come from every direction in this life because Satan doesn't care who he uses. Because there's not one person in this building who's my enemy. There's not one person in this city who's my enemy. There's not one person on this planet who is my enemy. But my enemy takes souls captive and uses them, uses them to perform His evil will. That's what He does. It, from, the, from the littlest to the biggest offense. When we separate the individual from the offense, it becomes easier to forgive. Because we recognize that this person who's come against me, this person who's spoken against me, this person who's wounded me in whatever way, it's not my enemy. This is another soul who's been taken captive by the enemy. And we, when we recognize that it's a soul who's been taken captive by the enemy, that should cause our sympathy to rise up. Because we recognize that this individual is trapped. They're, they're bound. They're under the control of a power that's seeking to destroy them and us. And I think about the, uh, all those that whom Jesus healed in His ministry. I think about a lot of them weren't nice people. Some of them weren't even Jews. But He had mercy on them. And He freed them from their captivity to our common enemy. In future lessons, we'll delve further into the nature of offenses. By digging deeply into the Word of God, we shall be able to see fulfilled in our daily lives the peace described by David when he said in Psalms 119, 165, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. When we're fully submitted to God, two things are going to happen. One, we won't offend other people. Two, we won't be offended 
when other people come against us. Because we'll recognize that it's not the individual, it's the enemy of our souls trying to cause division. Satan doesn't care where he puts the division as long as there's division.
wants to. I was actually looking at Joseph, and Joseph, no, Genesis chapter 50, at the end of the book. Um, I actually looked for the verse that said, you know, you thought evil against me, but God went into the good, but I just looked at verse 19, and it says, And Joseph said unto them, his brothers, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? Right. And it's like, yeah, wow. Mm -hmm. I love that. Wow, that's, that's... That's one of the most powerful passages in the Bible. That's love even it. more powerful to me than verse 20. I mean, verse 20 is pretty powerful. Together. Together, It's yes. so amazing. It's like to, to take away the... Take off the... Well, not that we can even put them on, but, you know, I mean, yeah, am I in the place of God? No. And as you said, and as Hector said, I mean, the, God is always interested in the soul. Mm -hmm. Always. And there's my soul. Right. My soul. Right. And and it doesn't matter, you know, I mean, by the grace of God, I mean, I don't know what I'm going to have to endure in this life. And I'm not trying to find out right now, but <laughs> all I know is that, I mean, I pray by the grace and the mercy of God. When the rubber hits the road, I mean, i got to remember, I'm not in the place of God. Right. Nobody's soul is mm -hmm. in my control. Right. I mean, barely my own. My choices will affect my soul. Yeah. More than they'll affect anybody else's. Right. Well, praise the Lord. I think we've had a pretty good lesson here this evening. You go ahead and close this out and I'll go ahead.